Good to see everyone this morning. Uh, beautiful Mother's Day. We always kind of debate whether we'll have more leaving or coming because it works both ways. And if you're visiting with us this morning here in the Bible class, we appreciate you coming. And uh, pastor allows me to teach Bible class. He'll, he'll have something more to say about Mother's Day than probably than, uh, than I will. But uh, we'll find out today some interesting things about the... Uh, oldest mother and the mother with the most kids and mother that had the meanest kids and whatever. <laughs> that might be a real contest there. <laughs> Open your Bibles to the book of Jude. We are started, it started again in this little short book and uh, we were teaching first and second John. Of course, uh, John the author there, Jude the author here. You can, uh, as we did I think a week or so ago, we identified that there's more than one Jude in the Bible, of course, in the, in the disciples. And we believe this was Jude that is also uh, named, uh, he's son of Alphaeus, and so this is uh, Jude Thaddeus. So that's not all that important. I'll say this, this is one of the most packed full little books you'll find in the Bible. And it is very current for you and I that are alive today. You know anything about your Bible and world events, uh, we see that uh, God used Jude to tell us something that should register on us really good. As bad as things are, anti-Godism everywhere, immorality everywhere, God is still in charge because he wrote about it ahead of time. And that's the good part, the only good part we can point to today. <clears throat> Quite often we hear something every week more shocking than last week. And all I can say, the only good side to that is it says the Lord is coming soon, very soon. And if you know him, if you're saved, that's great. If you don't know him, you've got something to be afraid of. And I hope you do have the peace that comes from knowing uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as, as, as Savior. It's, um, it is uh, amazing how that people go right on in the blindness as to what is happening when it's already been written, already been preached by good preachers for years. And it's like, well, that's a coincidence. No, it's not. It arrived on time, just like the scripture said that it would. And uh, that's the good side about it. We still have a God that's in charge. And we still have some victories. We'll have victories in the midst of, of it, no matter how bad it gets, we'll have victories to the end, and it will end. <laughs> uh, it did in the days of Noah. <clears throat> and here in Jude, there's actually a reference to those days. If you want to write it down, I'll kind of outline these. This is a short book. Uh, what is it, tier uh, 25 verses? I haven't counted them recently, but the, I believe it's got 608 words. It is amazing to me how packed full it can be with that short uh, number of verses and number of words. Years ago for a local newspaper, I wrote a, a uh, newspaper column every week and tried to bring some spiritual truth, some scripture to light in the column did that for a long time, and uh, they limited me to 300 words in the column. Now, I cheated sometime a little bit. If I cheated much, they caught me. <clears throat> so I played right around 300 words every week. And if you're going to say something, you've got to choose your words carefully if you, don't have, if you can't use but so many of them. They've got to have some meaning packed in every word. And so it is here in this book. It is so chosen, and God gave it to us through the penmanship here of Jude. <clears throat> he gave us so much, and if we really take the time, and I may not take all the time I should, but if we take the time to all that is referenced in these uh, uh, short verses here, we would cover quite a bit of the Bible. Now, that takes only God can do it in that few a number of words to draw our attention to it. So we'll, we'll kind of review a little bit. We already got started on it. 
And uh, <clears throat> I um, always liked the book of Jude because I felt like that he didn't, <laughs> he didn't waste anything. When he, when he said it, it meant something. It was hard. It was direct. It was where the tire met the road. And uh, you, could, you could just get a, a lot out of it. So today I, <clears throat> I think about this. I'm, I'm on, you're going to say you're repeating yourself. I'm going to repeat myself a lot to go through the book because you just got to, to just kind of double back and cover some of it. <clears throat> but in the, in the book here, it really takes us to the end of the tribulation period. Tribulation period is not given to the church. It's given to the Jews. That means the church is going to get out of here before some of this is fulfilled in the book, book of Jude. We call it the rapture. We're listening for the trumpet. We'd love for it to be today, to tell you the truth. Uh, we like John the Revelator. We just studied the book of Revelation not long ago. <clears throat> he kind of ends with saying, come quickly, Lord Jesus. <laughs> and that's my sentiments, uh, e exactly. Uh, I know the politics. I know the campaigns are warming up. I can't believe the absurdity of some of the stuff that is going on. And uh, whether you like Donald Trump or not, he sure showed there was two sides. The enemies of, of righteousness or morality or even Christianity have revealed themselves like never, ever before uh, in America. We're seeing that. We're seeing the dumbest stuff. Our court systems are, are no longer, the, I tell you what, they ought to take that image of the justice being blind with the scales. They ought to pull that blindfold off her because we got a double system going now. We got cheating going on. Uh, I'll get to it in a minute, but what I'm saying will actually fit <laughs> right in here. <clears throat> I was catching just a little bit of I guess it was local news, <laughs> showed a picture of a couple of guys. They'd been in a fishing contest. Who can catch the most pounds of fish in a period of time and win the trophy or win the money? They showed these two guys cheating. They had caught some fish and stuffed lead balls in them. Lead, bigger than marbles, balls in them. And they got caught, which I'm glad they did. <clears throat> And then I thought the depravity of man, all the way from down from a man catching a fish and cheating, all the way to the president that gets his millions from China and the other places. It spans the whole thing, brother, from the bottom to the top. Man is a depraved creature. He is sinful. He's out of the will of God in what he does. The big Ten Commandments, the last commandment says, Thou shalt not covet. Well, covetousness. No matter how much money a fellow has, he thinks he needs some more. Isn't that amazing? Back, I don't know who's supposed to be the richest man now, uh, but uh, Elon Musk, maybe, I don't know. <clears throat> but several years ago, it was J. Paul Getty. He was, he was wearing the title of being the richest man. So some reporter asked him, said, Mr. Getty, you, you have all his billions or whatever. You're rich, how much more could you want? <clears throat> Here's what the man said. Now he said it with a, with a smile. He said, just a little bit more. <laughs> you know what he was saying? He's saying the covetous nature of man never gets enough. Isn't that what the Bible says? The Bible says the eyes of man are what? Never satisfied. Ladies, that goes for you too. I... <laughs> I've joked with my wife sometimes, of course, she don't appreciate my humor quite as much as I do. <laughs> but sometimes when she'd <clears throat> go uptown and come back, I'd say, what did you see that you needed and you didn't know it before you went to town? Now think on that a minute. She'd never give me a good answer on that. I didn't know I needed it till I saw it. I didn't know I had to have it till I saw it. Isn't that what happened to Eve in the garden? Didn't she get in trouble looking on the forbidden fruit? All right, meddling around, especially for Mother's Day. I probably should have left, not, not said that. 
<clears throat> anyway, as I think about the things that's coming on, man's depravity has risen to the top, of, showed how, how when, when Adam fell in the garden, brother, and, and the human race was cast into sin, it, we thought it hit bottom a long time ago, but it's still finding a new bottom just almost weekly. It is an amazing thing. And that's sad. Uh, if we kind of get a hold of this thing, we'll find a lot of it referenced. I'll not have time to get into detail here in, in the book of Jude. To outline the book just a little bit for you, his reason for writing was to contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Now, he, he gives you that here in these uh, first few verses. And uh, reason for the writing is found in verses all the way through verse 4. Uh, reason for the writing. Then you have historical examples that he starts giving us all the way from verses 5 through 7. Uh, and, and those historical examples are written for our admonition. They, they happened and they're recorded for our admonition. We can be warned by them, we can learn by them, and we can see them repeating themselves over and over again. One time I tried to be real uh, inventive when I was preaching a sermon. I had to be young. I would have never tried this as I got older. But as a younger preacher, trying to hold attention, trying to get folks to see something. I preached on the second coming of Jesus all my life and still do. Can't hardly get through a sermon without it. But uh, I, I tried to illustrate it. Some of y'all remember some of the times I laid eggs up here on the pulpit trying to illustrate something probably. But I tried to make a point. The signs that we are to watch for, if we think about a great big circle, Sort of like this, big circle. For instance, we'll talk about the signs where Jesus said it'd be like it was in the days of Noah. All right, you go back to the days of Noah, Genesis chapters 5, 6, 7, and read what was going on. Then you see those signs come around again and around again. I guess I didn't break it, but I took a microphone like this with a cord on it. I'm not going to do it with this one. It breaks here in the world. <laughs> But I actually started swinging it over my head in a great big circle. Then I asked the audience to imagine. I let the cord out long as I dared. I don't know how it held together, but it did. And I was swinging a great big circle like this. Now I said, now imagine as it goes around the circle, it hits this point, it hits this point, it hits this point, it hits this point till it completes the circle. Let's say there was seven signs in the circle. It hits all of them as it swings around, like the clock hands going around the clock. Now I tighten up the cord and bring the circle tighter and tighter and tighter. It hits the signs faster and faster and faster as it goes around. That explains what has been going on biblically now for a long time. The circle is tightening and tightening. And finally, and I think we're right down to the center now. Very tight. And it's hitting the signs so fast, we can't even keep up with it. And the Bible predicts that. It predicts the time will come when the message will be so bad that you can't even, the messenger can't get out of the way of the next messenger. And that's what we call news today, or the TV cycles, or you that are, smart enough to use your cell phones, uh, hooked on them because it's something that catches our attention over and over. So when we go through the Bible <clears throat> and we read like when Jesus says in Matthew and Luke and so forth, he says it'll be like it was in the days of Noah. And uh, the evil increased and increased to the place that he said it man's imagination would be only evil from his youth up. We live in the imagination age today, don't we? You know what they warn us about now? They warn us about AI. You know who AI is? Artificial intelligence. Well, I'll say this. 
Uh, they say it's so increasing it's going to take over from the human mind. I, I got news for them. The human mind's gone. Something's going to replace it. No doubt about it. <clears throat> anyway, all of that is contained and pictured again <clears throat> here in the little book uh, uh, of Jude. Now he'll, he'll point out the advent of Jesus coming back. Now, I understand something. The first advent was when he came and died on the cross and rose again. The second advent is not the rapture, the secret rapture that we hope might come today. The second advent is when he comes back in glory, Revelation 19, leading the armies of heaven, has to take by force his creation. The creator has to take back his creation to be able to rule and put his son on the throne and to set up the thousand year kingdom of God on this earth, he has to come back with an army and take it by force. That's what Jude is gonna to get to. You'd be surprised what a main event this is in the word of God. I'm gonna jump ahead, you got to forgive me, I'm gonna I'm scatter it, but I tell you, if you, you just get these verses, you'll get the historical setting, we'll go back to that, days of Noah and so forth. Then he warns in verse eight through 19 about false teachers. Boy, we're in that age today, aren't we? And then he'll warn in verses 14 and 15 about the coming judgment. Man somehow thinks he can sin and get by with it, but all of history proves he can't. And certainly biblical history proves that, that he can't. And so, if you kind of notice how easily these uh, verses here, these short 25 verses will be covered in those divisions. But we're going to talk about them individually. So I'm going to jump ahead with you now just a little to point out something this morning. I want you to look at verse 14. Verse 14, that don't mean I'm skipping the rest of them. I'm going to come back to them. Maybe not today, but one day. It says in verse 14, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam. Do we know who we're talking about, Genesis? Remember he was not because God took him. He was translated. He's a picture, very much a picture of the rapture if it takes place. Now, it says Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. Now, this is not the rapture. Enoch, way back then, the seventh from Adam, said God is coming back one day with 10,000 of his saints to set up his kingdom on earth, to defeat evil, battle with, with at Armageddon against the nation. Satan is rounded up to fight him. Now, Enoch, seventh from Adam, back, way back, says something, and here we're reading about it, and here we know it's very quickly on the calendar now. Now, here, here's the thing we need, to, uh, uh, we need to understand. This is big in God's eyes. You and I, the biggest thing is Jesus died for our sins. We trust him, we, we say, thank God, that's big with us. It's big with us that he's coming back in the rapture to take us away. But what is the biggest with God is one day, He's coming back to put his son on David's throne and rule and reign on planet earth. That's the honor that belongs to Jesus. Now you think about it even humanly. If you'd have been able to give your son to pay a price like Jesus paid, see him spit on and crowned with thorns, and lied about and still hated today, would it be a big thing with you to see him sit in the victor's chair, <laughs> sit on the throne? So it's big with God. So Jude here quotes Enoch all the way back, seventh from Adam, and Enoch t spoke a truth. Now that same truth, the coming of Jesus to sit on David's throne for the millennial reign of Christ, the, little, the prayer that people pray all the time, all the time. I prayed it in the third grade in school, didn't have any idea what it meant. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, remember? That was back when you could pray in school, which stand and recite that. I didn't know anything about 
that prayer. I didn't go to church. I wasn't saved. Didn't know anything about the Bible. I just knew it was a routine that some of the uh, teachers, and then, of course, uh, then it become outlawed in 19, what, 54, 3, 4? Interesting thing. The atheist woman that took it to court got the Supreme Court to stop prayer in school was Mad Madeline Murray. We nicknamed her, called her Mad Madeline Murray. <clears throat> she had a little boy at that time in school. She used him as being offended by the prayer. His name was William or Bill. She used him in that court case. She hated God. She done all that kind of bad stuff that we know about. And finally died murdered by one of her own staff. It was a terrible, it's a terrible story there. Not only murdered, but chopped up and, and beard and so on. But anyway, she used that little boy in the court thing. He was innocent. He knew nothing. When Ronald Reagan was running for president, I went to a preacher's rally, a big rally that we had for him because we supported him. And, and uh, we used a big basketball uh, stadium out in the Dallas, te Texas area. And boy, the preachers turned out for it. We had a crowd. And uh, Reagan was getting ready to, uh, to speak to us. And I got in, me and some other preachers got in, found every seat we could find. And I had to go up in the balcony the bottom floor was full. Now, we're talking about the same kind of crowd you'd see for a big championship basketball game at big stadium. I found me a seat, sat down, and the man sat inside of me. I turned to him, and I don't know, I guess I introduced myself, and he said to me, he said, well, he said, I'm, I'm William Murray. And he said, uh, I just been saved. And he said, you preachers are going to have to help me. I don't know much. That was the boy that Madeline Murray used in the Supreme Court to get prayer out of the school, show all that hate that she had. And of course, he didn't have time to tell me all about it, but we came, became pretty good friends from that uh, meeting. And uh, still today, uh, Brother Carl back there was telling me he'd received a letter from him uh, this week. He has a great ministry over in the Middle East uh, working with the, with the Muslims, and he's done a tremendous job. Uh, but to get, to get prayer uh, out, of the, out of the school, we used to pray that prayer in school, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on heaven as it is on earth. I wonder how many folks really believe that, that pray it. How many churches this morning open their service with what they call the Lord's Prayer? That's not the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is in John 17, where Jesus prayed to the Father. This is a model prayer given to the disciples. Our Father which art in heaven. That's okay, nothing wrong with it. I just wonder how many folks understand the part when it says, Thy kingdom come. It is coming. And Jude here, when he gets down to verse 14, is talking about the advent when he comes to set up his kingdom. That's the biggest thing on God's calendar. That's when the devil's finally going to be defeated. That's when the earth is going to have the curse lifted. If you don't believe we're under a curse today, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> you ever notice how bad the curse is? I mentioned a while ago, man so depraved, he puts lead balls in the belly of a trout to win a fishing contest. And then the highest office in the land in cahoots getting a million dollars to this kid and that kid and this wife and that wife that was divorced and all. Did you see any of that? Amen. All the regular news didn't cover it. They don't want you to know. Amen. They're part of it. But this isn't, isn't the news. Amen. I'd suggest, in fact, I'm disappointed in Fox News now, right now, firing Tucker. But Amen. Newsmax is still on there if you know how to punch it and get it. And it's still probably the best one that'll, that'll tell you the truth. But they hide it and hide it and hide it and cover it up every, every kind of way. It's not covered up before God. He knows the whole thing. He's got the whole picture. And our country today is, is reaping for that. But this point I want to make with you is all through the Bible, this advent, this coming back, this setting up of the kingdom, this time, this final battle, 
this time when Jesus comes back leading the armies of heaven, you can find it if you watch it in the scripture in the strangest places sometime, hidden in a verse, hidden in a chapter as you go through the Bible. I just said to you that uh, Enoch was the first one to speak. Now, before I leave Enoch, I need to say this. You say, I know about the book of Enoch. You better be careful. It's been perverted so bad, there's no even real proof that Enoch ever wrote a book. This don't say he wrote a book. It says he prophesied. That's speaking. That's speaking. Be careful for these people that'll come up with something that's not in the Bible and make it have more authority than the Bible. Listen, God picked what he wanted in the Bible. He inspired it. He preserved it just like he wanted us to have it. You don't need anything else. <laughs> it's okay to read people's opinions, but just check them with the Bible. This is the yardstick. This is the plumb bob. This is what you check everything by. And if you don't, you'll be led astray before you know it. Day and time, everybody now has made the cell phone their authority. Never stopping to think, who's saying it? Where's their authority? Where's the proof? Just because it come over that little screen does not make it true. Oh, my soul. Americans disappoint me sometimes. I remember when, uh, now, now you're going to get mad at me, but go ahead. See, I, I don't too, have too far to go, and the rapture may even come for that. So I'm not too worried about it. But I remember when folks started, everybody going around with a bottle of water in their hand. I got you there, didn't I? And paying for it. Oh, gasoline is too high. It's cheaper than that water you're drinking. Did you ever think about that? I'll make you mad if I can on Mother's Day here. How many of them little bottles would it take to make a gallon? Then how much did it cost? And you think gas is high at $3. It is high. But you may be paying five a gallon for the water you're drinking. So well, I need the water. Well, why don't you get it out of the spigot like they got it when they filled up the bottle? You don't believe that? Y'all get me astray because of your unbelief. Every now and then I have to stop to prove something. I was traveling back. I was preaching somewhere up in Georgia. And, and uh, I was going to get home quick. So I was, all I was going to do was stop and get gas. I was not going to stop and get a hamburger. I was, just, I was making it home. And it already got pretty late after dark. But I realized I'm uh, pretty thirsty. And really in my mind, I thought a Pepsi Cola or a Coke or something would go good. But then I thought, that's not smart this time of night, drinking something like that. So when I gassed up, I went inside and, and uh, as I was walking from the restroom back out, I was thinking about maybe I'll finally buy a bottle of water. I, 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 listen, they'd go broke if they waited on me to buy it. I don't. I, I drink it like I always have, wherever I find it. Anyway, I'm walking back out, and it wasn't very crowded. It was kind of late at night. And I heard a little noise, and I looked over there to the right, and right down the hall was kind of a, kind of a heavy guy sitting on a stool. He had a wash tub in front of him. Like Mama used to do the wash clothes in when I was a kid. I mean, a big tub. He had a dipper, and that tub was full of water. And he had these new little plastic bottles, and he was dipping out of the tub and filling up the bottles that they were selling. It caught my attention so much, I stopped and I looked at him right in the eye, and he looked at me and he just smiled. I'm caught. I wonder where he got that water in the tub. You say he went down to the spring, clear water in the mountains. You don't believe that, do you? No, he went to the spigot. He filled up the tub because he was lazy, and he sat down and dipped it full instead of putting every bottle on. You say, I, I, no, you didn't see it, but I saw it. And it confirmed the susp suspicion I'd had for a long time. You say, I'm, I'm drinking pure water. Is that what the label says? Who told you it was pure? Why did I get off on that? 
got that unbelief look gets me off on on, <laughs> on stuff like that but I want you to I want to get back to the advent <laughs> I want to get back to the fact when Jesus comes he's going to set up his kingdom now you find that truth through the Bible in hidden places but it's always from Genesis to Revelation when it finally happens it's in the Bible I'll show you an odd place. How many of you remember how Moses didn't get to go into the promised land? What did he do? He, he got mad with the people, remember? And instead of speaking to the rock the second time, he struck it again, you remember? And God wouldn't let him go into the promised land. Remember that? Go over really to a book. I want you to go to the book of Deuteronomy. We'll kind of get the, over here where Moses is giving his last will and testament. We'll go to the last of Deuteronomy. Go to chapter 33, and my subject is not Moses' farewell address, the great man that he was. I want you to see hidden, somewhat hidden, and yet projected and predicted all the way to when we get to the end of the book of Jude, we'll be right where Moses is talking about. Way back here in Deuteronomy chapter 33. Wouldn't expect it there, also. Time won't allow me probably, but I would show you another place or two. Chapter 33, and this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, now watch this verse two. And he said, the Lord came from Sinai, rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with, now watch the statement, and he came with 10,000 of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Now watch it. He came with 10,000 of his saints. Now go back to the book of Jude. Pick it up with me in verse 14. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. Don't that sound like the same thing? Now, all the way through the Bible, once in a while, once in a while, sometime you gotta work at it to find it, God is still got a plan, and the plan one day is to set his son on David's throne and to bring his kingdom in and to rule and reign for a thousand years. Psalms 2, just the beginning of the book of Psalms, you read where he's going to set his son. The nations are going to uh, question it, which they would right now. Do you realize right now that if truly, if, if G he won't do it this way, but if Jesus came and let America vote on him right now, he'd lose the atmosphere we got right now. If he come and said, okay, I'll run for president in America, he'd lose. They don't want somebody in righteousness. You got crooks from every direction, and it's a power struggle from every direction. All right, I won't turn to it, but if you were to study the little book of Joel, if you were to study the little book of Joel, you'll find, and a lot of preachers and a lot of commentators get a little bit mixed up because they won't take some of it as literal as they should. Joel is talking about the end times He's talking about this day that Enoch prophesied of, this second advent of Christ when he comes back. And uh, there's three armies, if you study it close. I can't take time to get into it, but there's three armies in the book of Joel. Uh, one of them is typified by what we would call locusts or caterpillars. Another one is called the Northern Army. And it's the army of the Antichrist. Another one is called the Lord's army or his great army. Now, if you study it out, you'll find out one of those armies is the one that's coming back in Revelation chapter 19, the one that Enoch here and Moses spoke of as coming with 10,000 of his saints. Now, don't pay the commentaries too much attention because they... A lot of them won't tell you that. But the truth is, you know who that last army is? The Lord's great army? Look at your neighbor. Ask them if they're saved. If they say they are, they're part of that army. 
part of that army. You're part of that army if you're saved. How many of you ever studied the little ditty, little song in Sunday school, I'm in the Lord's army, <laughs> I'm on a zoom over the enemy. That's it. That's it. If you're saved, you're in the Lord's army. And we have a call to duty when he comes back with 10,000 of his saints. And that's a, that's a number that means an unlimited number of his saints. And we are going to assist him when he takes his kingdom over from the Antichrist. Yeah. Okay. Time's up. I better stop. Okay, Mother's Day, 855, that's not too bad a number. Praise the Lord for that, and I believe we'll have some more coming on in.